I want to start by giving us a scenario of where Kenya is at the moment. This is where Kenya is as far as conservation of natural resources is. We are faced with lots of challenges and conservation at the moment is at crossroads. And top on the agenda, you can see the items that are bolded that you can easily read like species poaching, climate change, infrastructure. They appear as um, issues that we are currently uh, dealing with. And so in this platform today, um, uh, we hope that uh, we will be able to tackle one of the issues among the priority issues that are listed uh, in that. Uh, further to that also, um, we are also in the process of, um, of um, addressing a lot of uh, issues that Kenya is going through. I'm just going to give you a screenshot. Like for example, uh, Kenya has got a wealth of a lot of insects, in fact 25,000 plus, but the endemic ones appear to be documented and you can see that is blank. The bad species also um, are 1,100 plus and we know there are lots of challenges that we are currently facing uh, to do with infrastructure that is affecting the conservation of birds. Uh, with mammals also we have 350 plus. And then with plants also we have 700, 7,004 plus. Then we also have under the freshwater fish, we also have 224 plus. And you can see the categories and the list of endemic uh, also in between and then the critically endangered. So this is what the Kenyan landscape is looking at as far as uh, conservation of natural resources is concerned. Therefore, our biodiversity is very important to the well-being of our planet, yet the impacts of climate change affect, in a broader perspective, issues dealing with livelihoods, food, and water security. Ecosystems and infrastructure are also among others. And so um, my desire is that uh, at the end of today's meeting, that we look at healthy ecosystems and rich bio diversity that will actually help increase ecosystem productivity. And when we talk about ecosystem productivity, we are opening it a little bit broader to look at the species within an ecosystem. And now we can ensure that the ecosystem thrive in a resilient environment, even as changes with climate change do happen. Um, and today we have a, a team of experts uh, that are going to lead us through today's um, discussion. Uh, we will introduce them shortly. And the purpose of today is to give us insight into the climate change environment and the impacts on natural resources, with a particular focus on how civil society can address threats to species and ecosystem. So that's the focus of today's discussion. And we will capture as much um, actions that will come out of today's discussion and we will put them into an action and strategies in terms of how we can escalate these issues uh, to the decision makers and if there are any legal uh, uh, issues that need to be dealt uh, we will also deal with them at the same time kenya is at the moment um, overhauling it's a wildlife conservation act and so if there are also issues that need to be legislated we will also see how we can make these recommendations uh, in the memorandum that has been requested by the ministry so this session is particularly very important uh, because there are several processes that are taking place at the moment and you are also aware that uh, the forest act also is currently under review or will be uh, going through some review. And so it's very, very critical uh, that we capture some of the actions of today's discussion onto uh, the ongoing processes, particularly at the policy and legislative environment. Uh, for some of us, we are also aware that uh, the climate change policies and uh, legislations are in place, though there are challenges on implementation on some of them, uh, but we will also be looking at uh, how we can bypass those impasses that are affecting the implementation of, of uh, the climate change policy and legislation 
and also see how we can mainstream um, the national climate change, national actions within the conservation of natural resources in Kenya and at the regional level. And so to lead us through uh, in today's discussion, um, I'm going to introduce to you Wycliffe Amakobe, uh, who is uh, an energy and climate change expert working with the Kenya Climate Change Working Group. And therefore, I'd like to give him the microphone to share with us about what Kenya Climate Change Working Group is doing. And then after Wycliffe Amakobe, uh, Dr. George Wamkoya, who is um, both a scientist, a lawyer, and a climate change expert, will also lead us through in understanding the climate change environment. And uh, he will also be sharing with us the various policies and uh, where Kenya stands at the moment and what we need to do in order to mainstream climate change in the wildlife conservation. And then finally, we'll have uh, Charles Oluchina, who is the program regional coordinator for IUCN, uh, talk about ecosystem-based adaptation. And so those are the panelists that uh, will be making presentations today. And after the presentation, uh, we will then have a Q&A session. We've given an hour for that. But in the meantime, we also have the question and answer tab on our Zoom. You can actually place your question there, which will be accessed by all the panelists uh, so that uh, they can prepare in terms of how to respond. To respond. And so I would request that uh, we all put our questions in the Q&A tab uh, and not uh, have a lot of discussions on the chat. Uh, maybe before I put the first speaker, I can see NP raise the hand. I don't know what NP wants to say. Uh, Sheila, could you enable the NP so that we hear um, who NP is? He has lowered his hand, so I'm assuming... Oh, he's lowered. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Sheila. So, uh, during the Q&A session, uh, the rules are that if you want to ask a question, just raise your hand and you'll be enabled to speak. Uh, and then uh, thereafter, uh, we will go as per, as per those who request for the floor uh, to address. But when the presentation is going on, uh, kindly put your questions on the Q&A um, tab. And if there are any additional comments that you want, we will also be following the comments on the chat um, uh, section uh, of, the, of the Zoom. Dr. Wamkoya. Uh, do we give you the floor to start? Yeah, thanks, Steve, and uh, a good morning, colleagues. Uh, it's good to meet you uh, in this field that I seem have to, to have deserted. Yeah, so I'm going to share with you a few thoughts uh, with respect to, to climate change, uh, because um, for quite a number of years now, um, I've been I've been involved in climate change negotiations, uh, and I happened to be involved uh, one of the eleven experts that were responsible for facilitating the the Paris Agreement. Uh, I, I chaired the session that was dealing with the preamble, Article Two and Article Three of the Paris Agreement, and uh, uh, I will emphasize. Uh, those again because they they lay the basis uh, of the rest of the of the agreement now when we're talking about uh, uh, climate change and wildlife uh, in the context of kenya i think uh, it, it will be it will be naive to look at it from a species perspective uh, it's important that we look at it from the the habitat ecosystem, uh, because that's 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 where they thrive, uh, and, it, and it's such, it's assumed that uh, once you have a, a healthy ecosystem, uh, or in, you you maintain an integrity of an ecosystem, then you are able to deal with the, the rest in terms of the species. 
So what, what is the, the, the global architecture of climate change to help us to understand uh, where we're coming from? One is uh, all of you, I'm sure you're aware, we have the United Nations uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change, which uh, was agreed upon in 1992. Uh, and I think uh, uh, many of you are, are familiar that uh, out of that Rio, uh, we had three uh, instruments which are important. Uh, one was the climate change. The second one is the UN uh, Convention on uh, Biological Diversity, the CBD. And the third one uh, was the one on uh, the certification, combating the certification. So those three real conventions are very important in the sense that uh, they, they, they are critical for Africa. Uh, because uh, most most of our economies and our livelihoods are land-based, and consequently, uh, the three Rio conventions uh, synergistically uh, influence uh, the way we use the resources, but also uh, the way we manage them. Uh, then, of course, uh, uh, it's a convention, just like we have the EMCA. Many of you are familiar with the Environmental Management Coordination Act. It is meant to be a framework law. Framework in the sense that it defines the principles, but the rest of the details and, and implementation is supposed to be done by the lead agencies. Uh, I'm sorry, we may not be implementing in the manner that we designed the EMCA, but uh, the way it's supposed to be is that it provides the broader framework and then the nitty gritty is supposed to be done through the uh, specific uh, laws. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, Dr. Wamkoya, can I interrupt? Uh, participants are requesting that you turn your video on so that they can see you. <laughs> no, 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 I, I'll have problems with bundles. Huh? So, oh, okay, all right. Yeah, so, so, so that's, that's any better. Towards the end, I'll, I'll, I'll put it on. Yeah, so so that that is that is a, a critical uh, aspect in the sense that uh, once we had the the framework convention, then it became necessary that uh, how do we operationalize that, and and that was determined in 1995 uh, during the first uh, conference of the parties where parties did uh, realize that uh, they have established a framework, but there are no tools uh, on how to implement or to facilitate implementation. And as a consequence, a decision was made that uh, there should be a protocol uh, agreed upon, uh, particularly to put a target uh, for those countries that uh, are uh, or, or had historical emissions. And that means uh, that category of developed countries, which were called Annex One. And so in 1997, uh, the Kyoto Protocol was agreed upon. And primarily, it set a target uh, for those countries that were great emitters uh, the European Union, uh, the US, and, 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 and the rest. And, and, but it left out all the developing countries, including China, India, Brazil, and all those. Because it was presumed at that time that it, it, we needed to deal with historical emissions. Countries that when that uh, uh, industrial revolution from which then we had more emissions. Then upon that agreement, the presumption was that the uh, uh, US will be, will be part of it. But uh, of course, when, uh, when it was taken back, the, the, the President uh, Bush uh, declined to, to assent to it. And as a consequence, uh, it could not take effect because the Congress also was very uncomfortable with it because it was setting caps. And once you set caps, it means that uh, they had to redo their development pathway in order to meet their target. And they didn't want, uh, from their perspective, they didn't want to be controlled uh, from, from an international instrument. And consequently, US uh, stayed out uh, of the, of the uh, Kyoto Protocol, uh, but EU and others remained in. 
And uh, therefore, the concern was, uh, how can US be out? And yet at that time, US was the main emitter of emissions. And, 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 and therefore that uh, brought a bit of problems. But also it took a long time before the, the, the Kyoto Protocol could come into effect. Uh, uh, so it came actually in effect in 2005. That's when it was ratified by the required number. And it took effect on uh, in 2007. And uh, it, it had a five year uh, implementation uh, framework, uh, which then ended or was to end in 2012. Now, uh, as we, we were proceeding in that manner, in 2005, uh, a decision was made that uh, the instrument in itself required that uh, uh, the, uh, before, two years before it uh, comes into effect, there should be a process to negotiate the second commitment period. And, and, and therefore, an ad hoc committee was established uh, to do that. But also in 2007, uh, I'm sure many of you are aware, 2006, the COP was in Nairobi, but 2007, it was in Bali. And in Bali, it was agreed that uh, they cannot, countries agreed that uh, particularly Annex One countries, developed countries said they cannot continue as being the only ones who are addressing climate change when in fact, uh, some of developing countries are now the main emitters and, 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 uh, and there they're looking at the basic countries where you're looking at uh, Brazil, uh, 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 South Africa, India uh, and, 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 and China. So, so that became a concern and, and therefore it was agreed that uh, a framework be established to negotiate the, 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 uh, uh, an instrument that to bring everyone on board. And, and, and that instrument was to be adopted in 2009. And that's why uh, every time you, you hear about climate change, you will hear about Copenhagen because that meeting was in Copenhagen and it was expected that uh, uh, there, there will be an in, a new instrument uh, which will bring on board all countries uh, to play their role uh, in, in, in climate change. Unfortunately, uh, uh, in 2009, uh, we could not agree uh, because, uh, uh, you know, multilateralism requires that all countries uh, participate in that decision-making process. But uh, because the uh, US was very strong, Obama, and it pushed, uh, that's the first time when Africa started negotiating as a block and, and therefore the chair of, uh, of the, 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 the committee of heads of state and government uh, of the African Union was uh, Prime Minister Meles as he was then. And, and therefore a few, a few countries were locked with Obama and they came up with, uh, with the Copenhagen Accord, which could not be adopted and therefore uh, fell by the wayside. And, 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 and therefore Copenhagen uh, is, is, is may be regarded as having failed, but it was important that it laid down certain principles or uh, issues that uh, became the informed the final the Paris Agreement. And one of them is uh, you keep on hearing about the 100 billion. The 100 billion was agreed uh, in, in, in Copenhagen uh, and where uh, the, the, big, the big countries uh, said they will be uh, mobilizing 100 billion every year to the year 2020 uh, to support the, 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 the climate change uh, efforts in developing countries. Uh, of course, then we, because the, 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 the agreement was not agreed, that uh, mandate had to be uh, extended. And then uh, finally it ended in, uh, in uh, Daban in 2011, when there were no uh, decisions uh, to agree on an agreement. And then we formed another ad hoc uh, committee, uh, which then uh, navigated uh, leading to the Paris Agreement uh, in 2015. And, and therefore it has been a long journey uh, that uh, uh, took, took countries to negotiate a lot and, uh, and give and take. And finally the Paris Agreement, uh, which uh, now is uh, the, the principal instrument for implementation of climate change, uh, moves away from the dichotomy of Annex One and non-Annex One countries or developing and developed countries in the 
true sense where uh, Annex One countries were to take responsibility and, uh, and uh, the others were to receive support. Uh, what the Paris Agreement does now is it brings everyone on board, but you can contribute best on your national circumstances. So the new terminology was brought in uh, to emphasize that uh, uh, yes, all of us are in together, but you must contribute to the level to the extent to which you can. And, and I think uh, uh, that it deviates from the original uh, 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 UNFCC, uh, which, which had a dichotomy of an X1 and X1 developed, uh, developing and, uh, and with, the, with the responsibilities assigned. Now, uh, the Kyoto Protocol, uh, which uh, many of you are familiar with CDM uh, and, and, and the rest, uh, actually uh, came to an end in 2012, and then uh, amendments were done, agreed upon in Doha, and that's why you hear of Doha amendments, uh, which extended uh, the Kyoto Protocol by eight years to end in 2020. But interestingly, uh, it took the eight years uh, to, for, for, for the Kyoto Protocol to come into effect. And, and, and therefore, it effectively, it ended 2020. Uh, and and uh, what we'll be looking at in, uh, in, uh, in, at COP26 in Glasgow in November will be uh, what do we do with, uh, with those uh, instruments that were under Kyoto Protocol uh, how can they be transitioned, uh, particularly the uh, flexible uh, mechanisms uh, transition to uh, the, the, the Paris Agreement, in particular Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. So I, ju I just wanted to lay out that historically so that you understand that uh, it's not a straightforward uh, 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 regime. It has taken, uh, it, it has it transformed from that dichotomy and therefore, under Paris Agreement, uh, countries are supposed to contribute through uh, their nationally determined contributions. That's the instrument through which uh, countries are supposed to uh, demonstrate uh, what they are doing and, and, and it will be assessed internationally. And based on that, uh, uh, we, we are able to establish whether uh, we are on track or not. Now, when we zero in on Paris Agreement, and I'll try to do very briefly so that uh, we give opportunity to others, is that uh, Paris Agreement in its preamble, uh, it does recognize the importance of uh, conservation and enhancement, conservation and enhancement in or serving as sinks or reservoirs of the greenhouse gas emissions. So that already provides a basis uh, as to uh, what the role of conservation will do. It simply means that uh, when you do conservation, which means an ecosystem, let's take, for example, Nairobi National Park, and then it means that uh, it has a role, it serves as a sink, uh, and, and, and in terms of the emissions, uh, carbon dioxide at risk uh, getting uh, sequestrated and, and therefore uh, reducing the emissions or removing the emissions from the atmosphere. So, so that is, that's a very important uh, function. And also we have wetlands uh, in, 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 within our uh, protected area. So conservation and enhancement has been recognized in the Paris Agreement as uh, an important uh, instrument uh, uh, for uh, uh, reducing emissions, uh, either uh, through uh, the sequestration or uh, through the, uh, the, 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 the as a sink or as a, as a, as removals. The second part is uh, in the preamble. So is that the integrity of the ecosystems is recognized as critical uh, for maintaining. Uh, the, 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 the temperature goal uh, or reducing emissions. And, and therefore, again, ecosystems in the context of uh, their role uh, in, 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 in reducing emissions or uh, playing that role, uh, moderation of, of, of climate uh, is, has been recognized. So that is the preamble. 
when you come to the instrument itself, the operative paragraphs of the, 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 the Paris Agreement, Article 2 sets what you'll call the temperature goal or the mitigation goal, saying that we should aim as a global response, we should all aim to maintain or stabilize the, 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 the average temperature goal well below two degrees, but uh, pursuing to limit it uh, to 1.5. Now, those figures of 1.5 and two degree are not arbitrary. They were determined by the IPCC, and, and, and I want to emphasize this, IPCC, because IPCC is the arm uh, that uh, collects evidence which evidence informs international policy, but also national policy processes. And, and I'll say a little bit about uh, the IPCC shortly. And, and therefore, uh, for it, it requires, that Code 2 requires that uh, uh, all countries do uh, make every effort to contribute towards maintaining that uh, uh, temperature goal uh, below two degrees pursuing to 1.5. And, and therefore Kenya is expected in its own way, uh, based on national circumstances, uh, to do that. And, and we'll see uh, how that has been done. The second 1.1b uh, 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 brings together this concept of adaptation, resilience, and low emissions, which means the mitigation. So it's simply saying that uh, you ought to find a balance between adaptation, building resilience, and uh, the aspects related to uh, the, the, the mitigation. So you cannot, and, and I think in, in conservation, you cannot separate adaptation from uh, resilience and from uh, uh, resilience from uh, mitigation, because all those are synergistically uh, being performed in an ecosystem. And, and, and I think that should be emphasized in, in the context of, uh, of conservation and enhancement. And then the third is, which I think is important, is that uh, the, 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 the Paris Agreement requires the, the, the climate finance flows to be aligned to low emission climate resilient development pathways, which in effect means that uh, uh, we should have, Kenya should have a long-term low emission climate resilient development strategy where, of which the sector like wildlife and, 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 and where ecosystems become very critical uh, are clearly defined uh, how they are going to play, uh, what role they are going to play in the, in the climate change uh, remediation. So that at Kotu is important because it lays that bar. But what is important, I think, for, for colleagues uh, in this sector is at COFO, which requires countries to communicate, to formulate and communicate their nationally determined contributions every five years. So the first was communicated in, uh, in, uh, in, as unintended in 2015, uh, just before the Paris Agreement, at which point uh, we wanted to know uh, how uh, a country's pledges are going to help to achieve that two degree or 1.5. And it was on that basis assessment was done and it was established that the pledges that were made by countries, including Kenya, were inadequate. Then it, they, they, it, within the system, there was a framework that in 2018, because the assumption was that uh, Paris Agreement will take effect in 2020, but unfortunately it came into effect in 2016 uh, way, way uh, earlier than it was expected. But 2018 countries were to do an assessment of their NDCs with a view of raising ambition based on what 2015 had done, but also informed by 
the, 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 the IPCC special report on uh, 1.5, uh, what the 1.5 degree means in that respect. And, and therefore, uh, that assessment was done, again, to show that uh, 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 all the pledges were well below uh, that. And, and within the instrument itself, it required that 2020, all countries do two things. One, uh, formulate and communicate their long-term, which is mean 20, up to 2050, uh, a long-term uh, low emissions uh, climate resilient strategy. And that is in Article uh, 4, Paragraph 19 of the Paris Agreement, uh, and also supported by Article 4.4, of the of the Paris Agreement, which requires countries to move and to try to move from a sector based to economy wide uh, uh, framing of the low emissions uh, climate resilient development pathway. So Kenya has uh, communicated its updated M M L uh, NDC, and uh, uh, I must say it's unfortunate that uh, the updated NDC was communicated before the long-term strategy was developed. Now Kenya is, uh, is developing the long-term strategy. So we're hoping that at some stage, we are going to have an alignment between the long-term strategy uh, uh, and the, the NDC, because the NDC is supposed to be communicated every five years and therefore becomes the milestone to see, to track how you are you are uh, delivering or uh, moving towards the, the 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 goal that you have set uh, under under the, the long term strategy. So that process is being uh, spearheaded by the uh, Directorate of Climate Change. Uh, I have some challenges there because my view has been, and I did uh, we did discuss this with them that uh, uh, because the Vision 2030 is coming to an end in 2030. If you're doing a long-term uh, low emission climate resilient development strategy for 2050 and beyond, it follows that it must be well coordinated with the Ministry of Planning because Ministry of Planning is going to develop a successor of a vision 2030, which must be aligned uh, with the long-term strategy, if at all you have any, and therefore you'll be bringing it to the economy-wide aspect because otherwise, uh, climate change uh, uh, in the manner that it is being done, we may have challenges uh, in, in, in delivery because in the end, if we end up having uh, uh, a successor of Vision 2030 that is not aligned with uh, with a, with a long-term strategy developed under the guidance of CCD, then it follows that uh, we will not have aligned climate change or mainstream climate change in the context it's meant to be uh, with the, 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 the development planning agenda, and, and that may have consequences in terms of uh, resource uh, mobilization from GCF and uh, related aspects. So uh, the question then would be, and this is a question I want to put to colleagues, is how many of you were involved in the NDC? I can confirm that very few of you, because I was involved in its final, uh, uh, and I was, I was the one who added some things on conservation. Uh, at the last minute, after even uh, members of parliament had already been, it had been presented uh, when I was asked to review it and uh, before it was submitted. And, and, and that to me uh, raises a question as to what extent does the, our sector uh, uh, play in defining the, 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 the climate actions in our sector? I think, I think we are a little bit uh, uh, low in that. The second thing which I want to raise is that uh, uh, I happen to have been a scientist uh, also with KWS, and 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 uh, and, and I must say that uh, we we when when we seem to have had our research uh, geared towards more on uh, understanding the ecosystem, understanding the species and rest, but we haven't looked at in the context of climate change. And, and therefore, uh, it, it would appear like that uh, we don't seem to have a lot of publications uh, in, in, in our area that uh, speak to the interaction between climate change and uh, our wildlife and our ecosystem. And, uh, and that has a limitation because then we don't find space in the IPCC reports, and, and which then limits the extent to which it informs uh, the decision. Uh, uh, recently, I've been uh, I've been part of the government process of uh, 
reviewing the upcoming uh, uh, assessment, IPCC assessment report uh, number six. And uh, it's very clear that uh, we don't have a lot of uh, uh, citations of, uh, if any, of, of uh, scientific papers uh, that have been done in our area uh, that uh, are, have been included or cited in, in the IPCC. So I, I would really request that uh, as the scientists that uh, we may now need to relook at the, the, the our research uh, uh, programs and see to what extent we tailor them also to answer the question as to the role we're playing uh, in uh, stabilizing uh, the climate, uh, uh, climate uh, systems. Otherwise, if we don't, then it's going to be very difficult for us to have evidence uh, to support a particular position that Kenya may want to take uh, in respect uh, uh, to that. And then uh, uh, the, the other point that I want to emphasize is at co 5 At co 5 of the Paris Agreement is so critical in the sense that it, it specifically mentions the ecosystems and biodiversity. Uh, many of the people think it is uh, dealing with only with the red plus, uh, which is the reduced emissions from uh, uh, deforestation and forest degradation, but it, it goes beyond that. And, and therefore, uh, I would have liked to see a lot of uh, projects, uh, activities being developed based on the ecosystem uh, and, and, and therefore uh, being used uh, for purposes of mobilizing resources. And, and, and just to give you a challenge, for example, uh, under the uh, global, uh, the GCF, uh, 500 million was set aside for countries to access uh, for uh, this type of work under uh, Article 5. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not very sure Kenya did. Uh, but uh, 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 I know Brazil and uh, and and others have, have have and the Congo and the rest have, have been uh, very active in that area. So what I'm simply saying is that we have instruments within uh, the, the 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 Paris Agreement that really uh, would facilitate us uh, to mobilize uh, resources uh, uh, to support uh, in that regard. Uh, I, I want to finish by summarizing on. Uh, in the adaptation, which is at co seven, uh, because at co seven is critical in the sense that it sets a global goal uh, on, on adaptation, uh, and, and and therefore, and and this is the challenge that uh, one would have to address. That if you were to do uh, a project, because I know we keep on uh, saying, oh, adaptation is our priority, it, it will require that you set a national adaptation goal. Uh, and then you 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 stretch yourself to say, okay, within this national uh, goal, uh, what what our sector is going to contribute to, and then through aggregation, because that's what is required under the Paris Agreement, we are able to know whether Kenya we are moving towards that adaptation goal that we have set, and also contributing to the global goal, and 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 and, and that simply means that one. Uh, we need to revisit our, our adaptation uh, action plan uh, and see whether we have a realistic uh, and clear uh, adaptation goal, which then all these other things will, uh, will fit in. Uh, unfortunately, under the Paris Agreement, uh, adaptation has been relegated to be voluntary, and, and, and this is a reality we must accept. And, and therefore, it's not attracting a lot of financing as compared to mitigation. So uh, my advice is uh, for, for Kenya, we must try to see once we identify our adaptation need, we have to look at what are the mitigation benefits that will arise to those investments that we are planning so that we are able to access mitigation resources, which will then eventually uh, help also address the adaptation. So uh, don't shy away from mitigation approach. Uh, and I think our instruments do require that to, to be to be so, and and and, and so uh, it's important that uh, we do we do that. Uh, finally, uh, there, there is room for under the the Paris Agreement for access to uh, climate finance from various sources. Uh, there is room to access uh, technology uh, uh, transfer or whatever we may require. 
and uh, and I think for climate finance, you know, the contact person is uh, Peter Dengo at the, the National Treasury. Uh, uh, for the uh, technology development and transfer, uh, the contact person is uh, Dr. Kelvin Hisa of Kirdi, uh, where you, you, you go and discuss and identify a type of technology that uh, may be required and uh, to be transferred and that it's useful. And, and, and the CTCN, uh, which is the, the mechanism under the, Paris, uh, under the convention, uh, should be able, able to facilitate uh, uh, that transfer uh, and support uh, uh, that is required. And, and of course, uh, uh, the, 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 the other thing that is important is uh, the tracking uh, indicators. I think for scientists, this is something that I want to put to you. One of the challenges that, uh, that we're now having is uh, what are the indicators to track that the adaptation efforts that you have put in place are adequate and effective. And these are beyond the usual project-oriented input output. You are moving to outcomes and impact. And, and therefore, we must start moving from uh, the project-oriented uh, to uh, outputs uh, to uh, looking at having put in these efforts in terms of investments, uh, what is the impact, the overall impact uh, in, in that respect, based on one, the, 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 the building resilience, adaptive capacity, and number two, in emission reduction, given that our ecosystems uh, have been recognized as important for, uh, the, for that role. So finally, it's very clear that uh, there are a lot of opportunities in climate change. We, I'm sorry to say this, that uh, uh, in our sector, we have not been uh, well organized uh, to uh, play a critical role. For example, agriculture team is very strong. It, it participates in all the negotiations uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, at the COP, uh, and I'm happy to be one of those who, who has been supporting that process. Uh, and yet uh, ecosystems and, and, and uh, conservation in, in, in our context we have not had um, a strong uh, team there. And, and, and apart from the team that is from the forest, uh, which, which comes to this negotiate Red Plus, uh, but otherwise in our space, we haven't. So I will really encourage uh, colleagues in the wildlife sector uh, that one, uh, this year uh, a COP is actually trying to synergize uh, climate change by diversity and a CCD or the certification. And the rallying point now is what you call nature-based solutions. And, 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 and the, 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 that is now been regarded as the unifying uh, 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 solution that will bring together a climate change, biodiversity, and the certification, bear in mind that uh, uh, in Africa, the comparative advantage we have is land-based resource, and, and, and therefore that nature-based solutions uh, will deal with uh, climate change, number two will deal with uh, uh, the, the certification, and number three will deal with uh, uh, addressing the loss of uh, biodiversity. If you look at the Kenya NDC, uh, you will see that uh, we, we, we have uh, both uh, nature-based solutions in adaptation, but also nature-based solutions uh, in mitigation. We had to do that because uh, it, it is a, it's a critical area. Uh, but I must say it, was, it did not come from our sector. Uh, some of us did it because uh, we had the privilege uh, of, of looking at the final document. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm afraid if, for example, that opportunity could not avail itself. We may not have had uh, those uh, those aspects included. So uh, I want to urge colleagues uh, that uh, this is a space. I know many of us have been uh, very concerned about and uh, more involved in uh, in uh, CITES. Uh, yeah, it's very exciting. But if you don't deal with the uh, ecosystem and rest, you'll have a problem. Uh, 
Uh, number two is that uh, there's now an opportunity through nature-based solutions in the context in which being defined uh, uh, to, 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 to deal with uh, the habitats, ecosystems, and mobilize uh, more resources uh, into our sector. Bear in mind that it was largely dependent on tourism. Tourism has collapsed, and I'm sorry to say that, and I think you're all aware it's, it will not be sustainable to rely on uh, tourism to fund our, our, our protected areas, and, and therefore we must find a, a new model. And the new model, one opportunity that arises is uh, that uh, relating to nature-based solutions or take advantage of uh, uh, our ecosystems playing the role of uh, stabilizing the climate system. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I've taken longer than uh, uh, I would have, but uh, I thought I needed to give you the, that uh, uh, history uh, so that uh, you are able to see, to understand uh, the, where we are and where we're going. And I'm sure my colleagues, uh, uh, Amakobe and uh, Charles will be able to share with some uh, uh, practical examples of uh, some of the actions that may uh, be important for the sector. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wamkoya, for the detailed explanation. In fact, uh, it was more of um, learning and, uh, you know, getting the history perspective of uh, where Kenya stands and where the sector stands as far as climate change is concerned. And thank you very much. Uh, I would urge participants, if there are any questions to Dr. Wamkoya, kindly post them on the question and answer tab, including other participants. We'll address that at the end of the presentations. Um, I would now uh, hand over the mic to Weekly Famakobe, uh, who is now available uh, to speak to us. So over to you, Weekly. Uh, thanks, uh, Steve. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. Yeah, I shared the PowerPoint with you because uh, I just noted that. Uh, yeah. So is that a slide view? Okay. Yes. Yeah. So uh, I'll be giving a snapshot of uh, who Kenya Climate Change Working Group is, and um, at the end of it, we want to explore uh, avenues through which we can be able to work together with um, uh, various players in wildlife and tourism to be able to uh, see that we are impacting on the sector. Uh, but then uh, I will mainly give an overview of how we, we work or our structures and uh, what exactly we have been able to do uh, in the short time that we have been we have existed. And then I will slightly talk or um, just mention a little bit on the interface of wildlife and climate change because I think um, the previous speaker has, uh, I think, elaborated uh, much on that, but we'll be able to give response to questions should there be. So we can move to the next slide. Uh, just, okay, just before then, uh, I, let me not Makobe, assume. Uh, yes. Makobe, could I just interrupt a little bit? Let me just pause you. I can see some hands have been raised. Let me just uh, allow Godfrey Kilonzo if he's got anything burning and Evelyn Namvuya, just those two. Uh, let's start with uh, Geoffrey Kilonzo, then Evelyn. Godfrey, kindly unmute yourself and speak. Okay, if Godfrey is having challenges, Evelyn. Those are the hands that I saw up. Yes, Evelyn. Okay, Amakobe, just continue. Uh, I thought that there were urgent issues because the hands kept on popping. Continue, Amakobe, sorry for the interruption. Yeah, so as you can see on the screen, I work with the Kenya Climate Change Working Group, uh, and of course, also associated with uh, other forums. Uh, but here I am there as a climate change and energy specialist. So next slide. Uh, 
Next slide. Ashila, the next slide. Next slide, again. Yeah, so uh, basically, he just go back, yes. So basically this one shows uh, how we work, but to give you a brief background, uh, we are a civil society network that is um, uniting to speak on behalf of the various actors and uh, state actors who are uh, in our membership as far as climate change advocacy issues are concerned and also uh, engaging with the communities and uh, playing a facilitative role in terms of uh, communication and sharing of information uh, between various entities that is um, from various user groups of uh, climate information, be it from farmers and various communities that our members work with and be able to articulate these at various levels, either at county levels or um, at uh, the national level to policy makers, it could be to legislators as well, and also trying to find opportunities through which uh, our members could also participate in uh, in the national um, discussions. So basically, uh, our alignment is around the UNFCCC uh, pillars, and as you can see, we have. Um, eight thematic areas. Uh, so we work through thematic working groups. And of course, there is a national steering committee, and then which is, uh, uh, which, uh, is composed of the various leaders of the thematic groups. And of course, there is a secretariat uh, that um, facilitates all the engagements. So we have a mitigation a thematic group, we have adaptation thematic group, we have climate change science and negotiations, we have technology transfer, we have gender and capacity building, uh, we have uh, in the, uh, that is marginalized groups, uh, that is uh, based on our NCCAP definition, that includes the indigenous people, it includes um, uh, issues to do with uh, either the elderly, uh, those those various marginalized uh, uh, segments. So the next, yeah, basically, um, I think our engagement, as you can see, maybe I'll be I'll be sharing more about this, but um, we also host. Um, several uh, institutions, including uh, Alliance of Civil Society uh, Organizations for Clean Energy Access, which is an international um, forum uh, of civil societies uh, in, in, in Latin America, Asia, Africa, yeah, and uh, trying to get into the other areas like Australia and so forth. So, we are the East African coordinate, coordinating node, but we also host them in the national coordinating unit uh, for access. And through this, uh, we are able to advocate uh, energy and climate change issues uh, across the continent and across the globe. And we, we already have regional nodes for Southern Africa, Eastern Africa, I mean, uh, Western Africa in Ghana and, uh, and Zambia. And uh, there is also one that is not mentioned there. There is a Sustainable Energy Access Forum. There is a platform for various uh, uh, actors in energy to be able to advocate for mechanisms that champion uh, access to clean and affordable uh, energy. As, all you, as you all know, I think, um, uh, Dr. Mkoya mentioned uh, uh, quite uh, in depth about uh, Article 6, yeah, and uh, also mentioned about um, yeah, the issues of emissions. And you notice that um, uh, energy stands out, or renewable energy stands out as a, a key intervention uh, considered for emission reduction because energy uh, is also a, 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 a big emitter. But also, when you go back in uh, in agriculture and forestry, 
or bioenergy still within that system, you notice that unless we up our adaptation measures in terms of how do we support our communities to be able to tap onto clean energies, for example, then our efforts in uh, afforestation are in vain because you do the you do the forest, but after two three years, people or communities need firewood because that is what they are using most. So how do we support communities to transition to other clean and affordable technologies, and how do we make these technologies affordable? So that is where we are getting the niche, and uh, that's when you can you, you may see maybe a lot of our, uh, our engagements are digging so much into forestry issues and energy issues, and actually we are also part of the sustainable energy access, um, sustainable energy for all um, uh, uh, technical team. Uh, that is at the national level and also trying to influence activities at the county level. Could you go to the next one? So basically, our delivery is uh, through uh, policy advocacy, and this is uh, informed by uh, evidence from research. And we do partnership with various research institutions and universities. And also, we try so much to bridge the gap between industry and academia. And uh, I think, like within this first quarter of 2021, we have had about uh, two visits uh, and uh, lectures in uh, academia and trying to strike out MOUs to see how academia can also can join hands with the, 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 the civil societies and the and the private sector and be able to champion or have a collective voice as far as climate change is concerned. Uh, most of you are uh, familiar with the net zero campaign, uh, uh, which um, I think you notice that the presence of private sector is so much and um, academia, but uh, when you come here in Kenya, the academia voice is very low. So we are trying to work with various universities, as you can see a poster there also, uh, talking about call for papers on sustainable climate action conference, which we was to take place last year in May, but uh, COVID uh, interfered a little bit, but this will be um, uh, affirmed, uh, I mean, should be able to take place in June this year. So uh, we, I think we have over 130 submissions of papers and uh, yeah, we are just trying to see how that will work. And of course, uh, culminate into some um, activities with the farmers. Uh, I think there is also a theme there on wildlife and whatever. So you can be able to see how to be part of it. Um, I think whatever is here on the screen is uh, quite uh, visible. As I talked about, we, you know, the whole arena of uh, advocacy takes various angles. And um, part of what we have been doing is actually to try and uh, influence various groups or equip various groups with the capacity to be able to advocate for climate change transformation in terms of uh, domestication of uh, various instruments at the international level and not just domestication but also trying to see that this has impact but this area has really been a challenge uh, especially because of resources but i believe when we come together and um, like we are in this meeting then we are able to have an impact because uh our communities, when you look at the words, you look at the 47 counties, look at the sub counties, come down to the wards, because from the Climate Change Act 2016, the wards are supposed to be very instrumental. The ward committees that should be able to uh, inform the uh, county climate change steering committee, which is like uh, a replica of the National Climate Change Council, but now at the county level. So there is the issue of capacity uh, that uh, this, all these uh, systems are supposed to be equipped. And uh, our focus here is on 
uh, uh, the communities? How do we build the capacity of these communities to be able to come to speed on what is happening at the international level and be able to advocate for domestication of some of these best practices, best practice um, undertakings? Um, so the, 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 that's what we do through our membership. Uh, I think um, this has been a, a little bit a challenge, but um, we have tried to revamp a little bit and um, through support from uh, United States, that is USAID, uh, we are doing realigning our strategic documents. Uh, I think uh, some of you uh, must have taken part in the strategic plan development advocacy strategy development, communication strategy development. And uh, we, we will be having uh, a series of meetings in the next few weeks to validate the same, to see to it that they are speaking or targeting those who should be targeted. Uh, that is uh, from the policy level um, to the user level. So basically we engage in um, training of media personnel and um, this, we had a series of trainings and even last year. Um, and also, as you can see on the screen, we also had um, convened several uh, legislative groups that are uh, specifically within environment and uh, energy and climate change um, interface that is within the parliament uh, at the Senate and um, at the um, parliament, parliamentary level. Uh, one of these was uh, during the uh, finance bill 2020, which most of you know really had a lot of impact on um, uh, renewables, which are very critical, as I mentioned, uh, uh, both from an adaptation and a mitigation angle. Um, I think on the National Climate Change Learning Strategy, I think this is a strategy that um, we are uh, together with the Ministry of Environment and uh, the UN trying to see how we can work with the Ministry of Education to mainstream climate change learning. I mean, uh, in, 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 through our learning institution, as much as this has been, um, ha has uh, we see some notable impact at the elementary level, but we need this to cut across all the sectors and um, the Kenya School of Governance is also part of this program. So we are hoping that um, in the next couple of uh, maybe two months, the strategy should be out. This journey started um, uh, two years back, but then um, we had a series of uh, high impact engagement throughout through last year. So next. Yeah, just also to mention, I think national policy related, related engagements, I think these ones are very clear here. I don't want to go through uh, so that uh, I can spare some little time. Uh, on county engagements, I think as you can see, we do much of climate change uh, finance advocacy, but this one is mainly working with the, the various entities at the county level to build their capacity and also to uh, work with them in coming up with the necessary policy instruments that uh, will be able to uh, enhance the sector. So like in climate finance, I think um, right now we have um, various counties that have been able to enact uh, legislations and policies uh, towards um, climate change addressing, including uh, creation of the climate change fund, county climate change funds, uh, other than the five counties that we had under the pioneership of the of, of DFID uh, program. Yeah, and uh, we, we do cascade most of this information into briefs and um, also try to break it down, especially when it comes to user groups at that at the elementary level that is farmers and what have you uh, it's an area that we are uh, really uh, trying to see how we can turn around especially in our strategic documents that i just mentioned uh, we also supported uh, several um, county committees in terms of uh, coming up with this uh, 
Um, the most recent one being Kajado, uh, Kitui, but I will not go into the details. So, um, and also being part of uh, various national task forces, we are able to also pass this down. So when you talk about county engagements, it's not just the county governments alone, but I, I, this also incorporates the, the communities and uh, C, CBOs um, in specific counties. Although this is again limited by resources, so we may not be felt in Kuala or we may not be felt in Mandera, but maybe we could be felt in Makueni, we could be felt maybe in Kilifi and so forth. So next. Yeah, so these are part of the partners that we have been able to work together with um, over time. We actually had a five year program that uh, just concluded towards the last quarter of last year with HIVOS currently having USAID, having Wireless Global Foundation, having the Mod Foundation there. Yeah. Uh, next. Yeah, so uh, uh, basically this slide, um, I think um, Koya talked a little bit uh, or uh, actually shed light, uh, in-depth light about uh, the sector, so I wouldn't go much into it, but I would just want to say that um, having the interface, as you saw, we have a thematic, and this thematic, we didn't have it before, but as things change and you look around, uh, we have evidence of how uh, climate is now impacting wildlife and tourism, then we had to bring it in as a, a standalone thematic group. And as you can see, the major climate induced uh, changes have resulted. Um, we can see disturbances and weather extreme events uh, taking place. Uh, if you could be keen since 2012, uh, especially uh, along the coast, we have had um, several lakes, which are a tourist uh, attractive site. I mean, several. Um, uh, hotels being submerged due to the rising, uh, that is a sea level rise. Some of the areas that were initially occupied uh, today, they are totally not accessible. Um, uh, the, there is the ongoing assessment of what is happening within the uh, Rift Valley lakes. Uh, of course, we are waiting for um, the official reporting, but then there are indications of climate change playing a role there. We also see uh, various areas uh, along the lake, Lake Victoria, for example. There are issues of backflow, but also we have evidence of uh, climate change or anthropogenic in, uh, induced um, forcings that are also uh, contributing to the effects around there. We see storms are increasing as well. And some of the areas that even never had, for instance, snow, you can see snow and we know the principles of snow formation. Uh, we, we see areas that never used to have wildfires. They are, they are uh, we mean, Abadeas and, uh, and, and Mount Kenya, and you see various hectares burning up. You know, when you see what happened last year over, 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 over um, Australian continent, for example, those fires burned, uh, the fires, the wildfires burned several hectares, I mean, massively. And you know, when that happens, there is emissions that are, uh, you know, that, that contributes a lot of emissions into the atmosphere and having an equivalent sink, maybe doesn't, it's not uh, an easy within the short period that we have. And the indications show that, uh, for example, we have, uh, there are areas in Africa that have warmed with over four degrees even as we talk about uh, globally, uh, are, um, maintaining the temperature rise between 1.5, I mean, at 1.5 or in two degrees above the industrial period. But 
we have areas which are already experiencing uh, this rise that is over four degrees. And even talk about Nairobi, when you look at the NCCAP, um, that is 2018, 2022, uh, it's indicating over four degrees rise within just Nairobi. And I think the effect of the urban heat island and what have you, uh, we see that is temperature, temperatures rising above normal. We have uh, frequencies of floods, uh, activities increasing just Last year alone, we lost over two uh, over two hundred, I think, uh, from the reports that were going around uh, from uh, extreme weather-related activities. But this was no, this is specifically for floods during the March, April, May season, and um, this was worsened with the corona, of course. And as you are talking about the people, are we accounting for the wildlife? For example, are we uh, accounting for how many uh, uh, species uh, were uh, affected? As we talk about droughts, do we quantify the 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 the, the, the level of impact, especially um, on on the flora and the fauna? And then, uh, in terms of uh, the consequences of climate change, I think um, I will want to skip uh, some of those areas. Uh, apparently, this is my last slide, so I want to take the next uh, four minutes maybe to be done. So the issue of wild, human wildlife conflicts, I think um, these are likely to increase as human and wild uh, species compare, I mean, compete for the same resources, which are actually reducing. And uh, you look at the constructions happening, we have road, I mean, transport system expanding, and we are getting into the wildlife corridors. How are we able to stand out? And this is the reason why we need to work together to have a strong voice, for example, within Conservation Alliance, how can we work together with the Kenya Climate Change Working Group? How can we work with other entities that are like-minded to have a strong voice that will be able to advocate for the necessary changes, be it at the policy level, be it at the community level, because in most cases, we tend to look so much onto the government. Of course, it, there is a lot of, uh, I mean, when the government uh, has a lot of, uh, the, I mean, the, um, impact, but the communities also need to be involved. So how are we involving them? Because they are also part of the uh, inducers of these problems that we are having. And again, when this wildlife, uh, for example, if it is uh, the animal, wild animals, when the, their uh, environment is disturbed, so they get into uh, homesteads and then, the, so the conflict is not with the government primarily, uh, it's with the communities, then the government comes in. So all these, these segments need to be involved. And now we have counties, how can we form strong, um, uh, advocacy or lobby uh, uh, forces that can be able to uh, initiate the necessary changes. So that's why we have the wildlife and tourism thematic working group. And uh, I would really um, wish to request majority of you to join uh, at institutional level. I'll talk about it maybe in the next slide, which has uh, the link for the membership. But then the, the issue of wild, wild, wild life, I mean, the fires, health and diseases. And th this is very critical, by the way, because we see the changing ecosystems and wildlife, humans and livestock will be affected by the emergence and increased spread of pathogens geographically and ac across uh, various boundaries. And remember one thing, uh, uh, when we are talking about impacts in Kajado County, uh, I mean, the wildlife do not reach the boundary for Kajado County and then they return. No, some of these things, they, they are uh, transboundary. I mean, they, they, they are across boundary. So as we engage, we also need to look at how do we even use the regional blocks in our bargaining, in our capacity building activities. There are those uh, shared resources like water. Uh, maybe let's talk about the Mara. So how can we engage the various blocks within there or counties within there? 
to be able to come to speed with the necessary changes that are required. You notice that. Um, we just could, just a know. reminder, we are running late. Uh, could you kindly wind up for the next presenter? We have uh, 30, about 30 minutes left. Yeah, and I think I've taken less than 20. So uh, I think um, maybe in the next two minutes I should be, I should be done. Yes, yeah, so I think uh, whatever that is remaining is self-explanatory. Uh, I will have dug much on measures for adaptation to climate change and in terms of um, how to maintain the current ecosystems as, uh, with respect to wildlife and, um, uh, I mean, the wildlife that is um, uh, the flora and fauna. But I, I think also something Wamkoya mentioned on um, nature-based uh, solution, I think this is very critical. And uh, it's good that this is part, partly in our NDC, but these are the things that we need to amplify uh, so that uh, we have them on, on, on the ground. Um, and the issue of um, adapting integrated and landscape approaches, um, uh, the issues of invasive species, I think it's something that um, we, we really need to talk about because uh, that is not just affecting the wildlife alone, but also various uh, other uh, entities in the system. So we can go to the next slide. Yeah, so as you can see, uh, for, for in, in terms of uh, joining information, if you go to uh, www.kccwg.org website, there is a membership tab. So when you click on it, you will be able to, there is a, I mean, there is a form, a, a page that will, will come as an interface, then you can be able to fill the required information and uh, you just need to check the last box and the information will be delivered to our database. Um, otherwise, because of time, I think I will, in, I will not go into much details, uh, but once you fill the form, we can be able to retrieve and uh, uh, engage with the, with the respective thematic groups uh, or group lead. Uh, for this particular one, I think, um, uh, uh steve is also playing a critical role in the in the thematic and so i want to extend this opportunity to you feel free to visit the website and um, in case of any challenge you can always reach reach me through the email right there or um, or the phone number right there so otherwise thank you for this opportunity and uh, i'll be standing by in case of any question thank you Thank you uh, very much, uh, Weekly Famakobe, um, on that detailed uh, presentation on the work that you're doing at the Kenya Climate Change Working Group. Uh, and uh, I would request participants, if there are any questions, continue to post them on the question and answer. I can see Dr. Wankoy has answered this bit. And uh, Weekly, if you can also check on that tab also to respond to one question that has already been posted. Uh, because of a um, time, and um, we want to to, 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 to honor the time schedule for this. I would like to hand over the microphone now to Charles uh, Uchina uh, so that he can do his presentation. Uh, welcome, Charles. Well, thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you, colleagues. Uh, I think it's a pleasure meeting you again. Um, it's not the normal that we would have wished for, but we're all trying to uh, adjust to a working uh, arrangement. So. Um, I'll, I'll briefly take you through uh, IUCN uh, framework uh, known as uh, ecosystem-based adaptation. But I'll preface this by saying that uh, for you who are new to IUCN, is the largest uh, uh, conservation organization globally uh, as a diverse network that brings together civil society and governments uh, established in 1947. Uh, its membership is 1,400 government and uh, uh, civil society members, and we have uh, 17,000 scientists uh, who are affiliated to 
IUCN. And, you know, they run the gamut from anything from global environmental management, uh, issues around environmental law, education, special survival, uh, protected area, and now indigenous and local people and communities. So it's, it's, it's such a broad network. And uh, I think uh, we'd be delighted to see more of Conservation Alliance of Kenya members uh, subscribe to IUCN. Uh, in Kenya, we have um, a presence here as the headquarter of the East and Southern Africa region uh, office, uh, which is 24 uh, countries within the region. And uh, we have projects and programs here that deals with the climate change. Uh, most recently, we uh, signed the 34 million US dollar five year program uh, for climate resilience. Uh, it's known as towards ending uh, drought emergencies. It's abbreviated as Twende that is being implemented uh, in, in, in Northern and Southern Kenya. That is uh, around Chulu, Makweni, uh, as well as uh, Isiolo, uh, Masabit and Wajia Triangle. So we, we have some of those practical aspects of uh, what we're doing and uh, a couple of new other programs are in the pipeline. So I want to be short uh, because because we've listened a lot to uh, some of the theoretical policy constructs of climate change and how it relates to um, the work we want to do uh, here as uh, members of uh, Conservation Alliance. Uh, so I'll, I'll quickly move to um, give you an overview of uh, ecosystem-based adaptation standards. Next slide. So we all know um, ecosystem services, what they are and the benefits. So I wouldn't rehash that, but I'll just give on the second bullet an overview of um, uh, the use of ecosystem uh, based adaptation. Um, it's, it's a part of an overall adapt adaptation strategy to help people and communities to adapt the negative effects of climate change at local nation, regional, and uh, global levels. So it is that systemic level outlook that uh, George in his presentation mentioned that uh, you can't just take a protected area boundary and want to do climate adaptation uh, within the perimeters of uh, that estate, but you have to look at the whole complex of the system and how it relates to the delivery of the services and goods. And so EBA uh, takes that uh, system outlook uh, to be able to uh, influence uh, do the analysis and deliver uh, a series of solutions uh, at various levels, as we'll be seeing uh, through the next uh, slides. Uh, next. So uh, why are, sorry, why are ecosystem-based approaches um, relevant? So we are looking at the relevance because we also have other engineered approaches, what we, got, what we call green solutions, uh, gray solutions, which uh, could be, for instance, uh, uh, using um, uh, architectural designs uh, that uh, adopt to, you know, uh, disaster or being able to channel rivers, but we also have uh, nature-based approaches which, um, you know, affect ecosystem at a, at a more kind of cost-effective level and uh, they are more sustainable in the long run. So uh, the relevance of EBA is about lowering costs and being more cost-effective than alternatives, um, especially in long term, and local communities can actually apply this by themselves. Uh, we see that uh, EBA approaches have multiple benefits, uh, including uh, you know, livelihoods, uh, impacts, uh, aesthetics, as well as on biodiversity. And then uh, ecosystems can adapt naturally, uh, whereas engineering constructions sometimes do lead to maladaptation. What we are seeing, for instance, an example of that engineering solution is we've seen the issues of um, you know, constructed dams and what happens when those crash or collapse, the downstream impacts are always catastrophic. So how can we apply other related alternative solutions using EBA uh, to be able to adapt effectively to a changing climate? And by changing climate here, not only focusing on drought, which has been sort of the default, but we're also looking at flooding, you know, in different environments. We're looking at ocean bleaching, you know, in within coastal mangrove coral systems. We are looking at um, extreme, you know, um, uh, climate uh, factors such as cyclones that we're seeing in increasing within our region. Uh, next slide. So we have examples and apologies for the um, um, that uh, resolution. Uh, it's a bit um, too uh, small, but uh, it speaks about um, examples of EBA projects within uh, IUCN at um, project level, ecosystem level, and regions. So I wouldn't read through that. Uh, this slideshow will be, this slide deck will be um, available for you to refer to at the end of this, but we have drylands, we have mountain regions, 
uh, we have a coastal marine forests, agricultural landscapes and others, which uh, the application of EBA uh, does work. Next slide. So there are EBA related activities. And so these are some of the uh, solutions. So on, on the right, uh, we have um, some of the activities that uh, directly uh, constitute uh, EBA solutions and are applied at a specific uh, system level uh, that influence um, you know, livelihood changes, uh, restoration uh, policy agenda, uh, even the gender and youth mainstreaming, all those uh, come across as relevant uh, within this uh, multiple and diverse uh, systems uh, that uh, we operate under. Next slide. So we've done uh, case studies as IUCN about the effectiveness of uh, EBA uh, in Asia, Africa, and Central and South America. Uh, we've tested EBA, for example, in Africa, in Burkina Faso, in Senegal, uh, South Africa, Uganda. So I'll be later on giving a very high level kind of uh, example of how in Uganda, we have been able to demonstrate uh, the application of EBA solution in a particular highly vulnerable uh, mountain ecosystem. Next. So there are components uh, that uh, are, are essential in uh, development and implementation of an EBA framework. Um, first, we have to have clear standards in terms of the uh, methodologies. So in our case here, I'll be making reference to Mount Elgon. Uh, you all aware about this transboundary ecosystem. Uh, it's, it's, it's both a very unique uh, conservation area estate and it also uh, has a, a very robust uh, human development, human settlement interface in the effects of climate change are, are really felt across that spectrum. And so we've sort of used that as sort of our microcosm of how EBA will work. So we, we, we develop the methodologies and then we apply and test the methodologies and tools. Uh, we implement them at site level uh, to be able to test uh, how uh, that adaptation and re resilience is working. We document that. And then this business case is scaled up at national and policy level. Next slide. So this is sort of our case study example. And uh, it looks at this, the general issues around the uh, climate change impacts uh, in Uganda. So this is broadly looking at the various mountain ecosystems, for example, from the Ruenzori's uh, to looking at uh, Mount Elgon and uh, Lake Victoria. Some of these are shared with Kenya. So it speaks to uh, some of the changes that have been manifest, which are not any different from what uh, my colleague um, uh, Makobe mentioned in Kenya. So I don't want to uh, read in detail on that, but let's just move the next slide so that we look at how we've been able to uh, take this into practice. So uh, that uh, depicts uh, some of the impact of um, you know, uh, slides, landslides and flooding that have uh, really increased in magnitude and scope over the years, just because of um, the intensity of uh, the rainfall, land use change. Um, so we have this uh, climate systems, for example, known as microbus that tend to form in a localized area and they dump as much rain within a very short time that will have taken, for example, a two week uh, volume of rainfall. What does that mean is that uh, the, the ground below doesn't have the saturation capacity to soak in all these amount of water in there for there is uh, landslides, there is uh, flooding, there is just kind of total devastation uh, within, the, within the system. So uh, over the past, I think, uh, four years, more than uh, 350 lives in just one localized system uh, within the Mount Elgon side of Uganda have been lost. And uh, they haven't even accounted for uh, the loss in the uh, productive agricultural land, uh, wildlife migratory landscape, and other kind of side effects, including uh, diseases uh, that have come, for example, cholera, and the human wildlife conflict, because some of those are transition zones that are used by uh, the highland elephants of Mount Elgon to move uh, between the uh, wet season and dry season you know, grazing uh, areas. Next. <coughs> So um, the, this, this relevance uh, taken into practice and why it has been effective is that uh, EBA um, as, as a solution is, is very applicable to most of the vulnerable um, in a segment of the society. Uh, the, most of the majority and poor households that cannot afford gray solutions, these green solutions that come because of applying ecosystem nature-based solutions uh, are able to effectively help them cope and adapt. 
Um, there is also uh, the core benefits uh, in the second bullet. Uh, core benefits of EBA look at what are other multiplier uh, benefits that come across uh, because of applying the uh, ecosystem-based nature-based solutions uh, from you know, livelihoods improvement, uh, for example, agricultural restoration, food security, uh, being able to address issues of uh, malnutrition and hunger. Um, we're also seeing that um, uh, they also uh, address other human well-being factors, for example, uh, addressing you know, uh, waterborne aspects. Uh, so uh, there is a good case of using EBA uh, to address um, at a societal level uh, the impacts uh, that you know, these climate uh, shifts are resulting, but the solutions being able to um, impact that systemic change. Next slide. So um, these slides just demonstrate um, from a practical point of view, um, what has been done? I mean, after all this theory, after all this great policy, what does change look like? Because at the end of the day, what policymakers, what the political class, what decision makers want us in the sector to do is being able to simplify. What does it really look on the ground? How does change look like for people, for nature, for wildlife? Uh, so um, in Uganda, through applying uh, these uh, ecosystem-based adaptation uh, practices, we've seen, uh, for example, in some of the most vulnerable um, riparian system, over 165 kilometers of uh, riverbanks demarcated and restored. These were areas of... Um, uh, you know, flood erosion. Uh, there were there were areas where uh, during you know you know peak uh, high rainfall, uh, communities couldn't access and utilize the services. But because of uh, just instituting appropriate governance, uh, restoration, and policy measures, we're seeing uh, this beginning to happen. Um, so communities have been also brought together to set up committees that you know, take care from an ecosystem governance point of view and households participating uh, in these uh, watershed conservation uh, programs have increased tremendously. Uh, the next slide. Uh, we've seen uh, um, very aggressive riverbank rehabilitation uh, through natural re regeneration. This is just uh, you know, a rest and recovery process that allows the indigenous and native species to come back. But we also have assisted regeneration that brings in uh, that kind of uh, direct replanting and restoration uh, within some of the endangered uh, system. And then communities afterwards do set up their own kind of bylaws to ensure that uh, there is policing and there is enforcement uh, that destruction that uh, will occur by other human induced activities uh, do not obtain. Uh, next slide. Hello, next slide. Yeah, so we also have uh, flood management through construction of uh, trenches, contour, grass strips, and tree planting. I've mentioned before, so I wouldn't, again, spend a lot of time, but there are numbers there that demonstrate the impacts, uh, these impacts of using nature-based solutions uh, for adapting, uh, bringing in uh, these buffer strips that reduce, um, you know, soil. Topsoil is one of the most underrated uh, ecosystem uh, good and service uh, that uh, we in environment need to really focus on because the more we lose of it, be it in rangelands, be it in the productive land, landscape, be it in forest system, the more we're losing the uh, functionality of this system to continue sustaining life as we know. Uh, next slide. So I don't want to delve uh, a lot into that last slide, but it's, it just speaks about how the model of ecosystem-based adaptation uh, can be used to be incorporated into uh, public and social protection programs, uh, how it can be used at county level, uh, climate change planning and management, and how we can use to upscale uh, payment for you know, ecosystem services. As George mentioned, uh, with the uh, situation as it is, uh, with the COVID and tourism economy uh, sort of crashing uh, as a consequences of uh, close down of global travel and other re uh, related restrictions. What are the other kind of alternative scenarios we can apply as conservationists using climate ecosystem based adaptation solutions to uh, create alternative revenue streams and restoration streams that uh, our players uh, can attribute to. So I just want to close by um, provoking uh, two or three questions about what I've just presented. Um, uh, why hasn't conservation or 
uh, protected area management not being mainstreamed in uh, climate-based uh, um, strategies and programs? Why are we not there front and center in all this GCF and GEF discussion uh, locally, regionally, and globally? Why? Have we done enough to do the advocacy, to do the uh, credibility information uh, enhancement? Have we done uh, enough to network? Uh, the other thing is looking at the uh, value for providing um, the, for example, payment for ecosystem service, carbon sinks, uh, values that are protected area system, both the government gazetted one and community and private ones. How can they be uh, brought into the space of being the uh, sort of uh, nucleus for uh, building um, a climate solution across uh, various landscape. And then uh, finally, uh, where is our sort of uh, outreach to uh, other non-traditional players, including uh, you know, philanthropy, private sector players who have an interest to see that uh, they can uh, contribute and play a role on climate uh, solution uh, within uh, the estate we work under. So I want to thank and give it back to Steve for discussion. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Charles, uh, for that presentation on the ecosystem-based adaptation. And to all the presenters, uh, I remember Wamkoya started by saying that in the sector, uh, particularly of natural resources and in the wildlife sector, if we focus on species, we will lose out on uh, addressing quite a lot of things. Uh, and uh, he did mention that the ecosystem-based approach is the way to go uh, so that you secure the ecosystem. And once the ecosystem is secured, then the species within the ecosystem itself are also safe. Uh, <clears throat> and then he also took us through the process of uh, UNFCC and uh, where Kenya at the moment stands. And uh, he did actually challenge us that there is very little involvement of the wildlife sector in the climate change processes, uh, particularly um, on the negotiation front. And then also there were other actions uh, that had been adopted, uh, which uh, we seem not to, uh, to follow up. And so there was a rally call that we need to get involved in the UNFCC process. Uh, then Amakobe uh, took us through the Kenya Climate Change Working Group uh, by mentioning to us their role in the international negotiations, uh, particularly in the UNFCC framework, um, and uh, what they do and, um, and, the, and the, the partnership uh, that extends the work that Kenya is doing to the West Africa region and other uh, countries, uh, particularly with access. And also the rally call to see how the wildlife sector can work closely with the Kenya Climate Change Working Group uh, to ensure that we strengthen the thematic group on wildlife and tourism. Uh, and then uh, Charles Oluchina in his presentation literally was summing up what Dr. Wamkoya had mentioned in terms of how we can um, adopt the ecosystem approach as a way to mitigate, adapt, and develop resilient ecosystems uh, where both people and species uh, and the services that we access from the ecosystem uh, can continue to serve as well. Um, so those are the key highlights that I picked and quite with a lot of challenge from every presenter. And uh, there were questions that uh, had been raised to Dr. Wamkoya, which he had answered. And then there are questions, all, there was also one question for Weekly, which he has answered. And now because Uluchina has finished his presentation, he has two questions, which I would like to read to him. Uh, one of the questions for you, Charles, is from Munira um, Bashir, who is well known to you. Uh, thanks for the great presentation. Do you have a case study for Kenya, please? Uh, I think the, the, the Ugandan case is very encouraging and we always look at it and say, why don't we have a similar case study in Kenya? So that's one question for you to answer. Uh, then the second one is from Olivia Adiambo. Uh, she's saying, what's the role on national government in scaling EBA approaches? Is there a large scale uptake outside the donor funded project? So those are the questions for you, Charles. Yeah, so thank you, Steve. Uh, and uh, Munira, hi, good morning, and uh, trusting you're keeping fine. 
Um, regarding uh, case studies for Kenya, yeah, we we do have uh, small, smaller, smaller um, scale uh, examples I can provide you. Uh, but as I said, um, right now we want to test a very uh, large scale project that has just been approved. Uh, this is the 34 million US dollar uh, towards ending drought emergencies uh, program. Uh, it's a very integrated program that looks at uh, ecosystem level planning and that will be led by the National Drought Ma Disaster Management Authority, NDMA. Uh, we will have a component that looks at uh, resilient uh, value chains um, that will be uh, supported a lot by um, Conservation International. And then there's a component that looked at actual restoration that uh, would be led by the State Department of Livestock. Uh, so uh, it's an integrated program working in multiple landscape. And uh, we hope um, to use this as sort of a case study that uh, at scale, we can demonstrate how the interface between natural consub system are, are, are well positioned uh, to um, demonstrate um, EBA at, at large scale. So uh, look forward uh, to um, uh, reading from me, uh, but as also you are aware, one of your uh, constituent members, NRT, is a participant in these projects and issues of uh, rangeland restoration uh, using, uh, you know, natural vegetation and natural systems, traditional uh, uh, grazing rotational systems uh, as adaptation, as opposed to, you know, always using uh, very sophisticated systems uh, will be applied. Uh, so uh, I think I, at this moment, that's what I want to make reference to. Uh, regarding the second question, really the role of government is about providing the uh, policy framework that creates for integrated uh, ecosystem-based adaptation planning. Uh, as currently uh, constructed, it's not easy uh, for us in Kenya. I know under the National Climate Change Strategy and Related Policy Document, National Action Plan, there is the aspiration and the principles, but without that guiding policy framework, and I think NEMA should be the one leading it, we haven't done enough of um, climate-based ecosystem uh, planning uh, for decision-making, for investment, and for management. Yeah, so what we've had is very sectoral. Uh, so people in livestock plan on their own. People in conservation are on their own. People in transport are doing their own urban area. Okay, counties are also trying to do things by themselves. So I think one of the things that we would like to advocate for is we would like to uh, see more of that kind of integrated uh, landscape level climates uh, related planning because you cannot plan for an ecosystem uh, using either a district boundary or using a transport corridor boundary or just using a small park boundary. It is really ecosystem. So to the extent that the government can really uh, help um, create that enabling framework, but as well, we are using these other tools to demonstrate to government. So the more we create the case, and I think it is a challenge to us as Conservation Alliance of Kenya, a lot of time governments also are able to react to proof of concept. So we have to come up with these models and position them before the, before the uh, key uh, institutions so they're able to have this uptake. Uh, what works can be seen to be adopted by uh, policymakers. Maybe if George and the uh, Wycliffe have anything to add on that. George has left. Maybe we okay. give Wycliffe an opportunity. Yeah, maybe unless if there is anything specific uh, from my end, I think um, what I would just say would be uh, general in terms of um, really uh, wildlife uh, sector coming out strongly. And uh, as it has been indicated, I think in most of the discussions and uh, general when we are discussing on some of these legislations and policy influence or advocacy areas i think uh wildlife is uh, it tends to be left out at uh, some point and that's why we need to try and hold each other so i think uh, perhaps the the narrative is is likely to change but uh, we strongly need to unite our voices uh, to be able to have the change that uh, we want to witness because you see at the end of the day the reason why i say that it's generally left out in terms of uh, when we are doing stock stock tech for advocacy in on, on some of the impacts that climate change is exacerbating in the sector you, you will see very, very little quantification in this area and uh, that's why also the issue of harmonizing 
uh, research outputs is very critical. And um, I think this is an area we may want, like at the thematic level for uh, our case as Kenya Climate Change Working Group, we will really want to try and uh, harness the necessary evidence and including um, some of the our resources that uh, uh, Charles has mentioned and try to see how we can work together to influence the sector. Yeah, I think that would be from my end. Thank you, Wycliffe. Uh, Charles, there is another question for you from Ken Esau. Is IUCN an AE for GCF? And what are the modalities of working with IUCN? Yes, thank you. So yeah, Ken, the straight answer is that uh, IUCN is uh, an accredited entity uh, for the Green Climate Fund uh, created back in um, uh, 2016. Uh, so we um, are, are open to working with the uh, both uh, states and the uh, non-state actors uh, to be able to uh, institute or implement uh, specific opportunities uh, for uh, climate change uh, related uh, actions and projects. Uh, so for instance, in this project I just mentioned, the 20 project, we, we anticipate to work with um, a whole array of um, uh, both uh, uh, civil society as well as uh, government agencies that I mentioned. Uh, and that is, is based on uh, mutual understanding and commitment to uh, the agenda of um, uh, the, you know, the Paris uh, Agreement on Climate Change, uh, as well as the, 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 the local buy-in uh, for the opportunities that we can jointly pursue. So we can discuss that there are many framework approaches that uh, IUCN operates under, either when you are a member of IUCN, uh, it gives you uh, that foot through the door, where you can be incorporated uh, to provide scientific or technical support, uh, but you can also play a role as a service provider. Service provider is uh, sort of uh, a soft euphemism of saying a consultant uh, for supporting IUCN uh, related activities on GCF does accept that. So let's let's discuss on um, the uh, framework engagement that, on how that can apply. And I also just want to add that um, we are also an accredited GEF implementing entity. Uh, so this year, we actually have submitted uh, a drylands forest uh, uh, impact program for the southern rangelands of Kenya, um, which we hope to um, get approval uh, uh, when the G GF board sits this May. And it's targeting that area from Suswa going south to Lake Magadi. Uh, and we would hope to work with a good number of you on this call. Uh, already we have Africa Conservation Center, we have um, Soralo, uh, we have KWS, uh, NEMA, uh, uh, we have Kefri, KFS are some of the parties that we're gonna be working with on that project. It's a six million four year, uh, six million US dollar four year uh, program. And uh, it looks at biodiversity, it looks at uh, uh, you know, land restoration, uh, it looks at uh, governance and also uh, helping build a, the linkages from rangelands to markets uh, kind of activity. So it's, it's, it's a very exciting program that we look forward to potentially uh, commence in uh, uh, September, October of this year. We also uh, implement other donor funded activities. For example, we are implementing a program in Garissa that is funded by the Austrians. Uh, it's about building uh, resilience for people and landscape. We are also uh, designing a program with WWF uh, that um, is funded by the uh, gov government of Germany uh, through their International Climate Initiative, IKI. Uh, we'll be looking at Mount Kilimanjaro uh, on the Kenyan side and really building resilience and seeing how all that interfaces with the downstream uh, system, including the Amboseli and going towards Rombo area. Uh, we also uh, look to scale up some activities at the coast, uh, looking at ma mangrove uh, restoration and coral uh, system resilience building. So there are, there are multiple things we're doing as a, as a scientific lead, as a technical advisor, as sort of a, a, a donor liaison on climate as IUCN. And I think uh, uh, we would be very happy to uh, work with uh, members of Con Conservation Alliance of Kenya uh, to advance this mutual agenda. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Charles. I think the uh, I would like to give an opportunity to three participants. If you want to ask the question on the floor, just kindly raise up your hand. 
and I can see there are two questions that have uh, come on the chat. And one is general, not really, um, you know, directed at anybody. And the question is, how do we help counties to adopt the climate change policy and come with climate change funds so as to mobilize resource, resources, increase levels of participation in this area on uh, clean energy? It's a nightmare to tap wind energy and small scale biogas models. Uh, I think uh, Wycliffe has indicated that he would like to answer that question. So uh, then the next question has come from Zablon. How do you become a member of IUCN uh, for instant as an organization or an individual? And how do you have an interest? And do you have, and does IUCN have an interest in areas of plastic and microplastic in our ocean rivers and lakes? I think that's directed to you, Charles. So over to you, Wycliffe, to answer the first question of how to adopt climate change policy within the counties. And then after that, we can ask Charles. And yeah, then if there's you. anybody who wants to ask a question on the floor, just uh, I will only allow uh, three participants, just raise up your hand and you get an opportunity. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Steve. I think um, for the climate change uh, policies and legislation, uh, this is one of the areas that uh, I indicated that uh, we are open uh, to working with the, the various counties, but uh, in terms of resource mobilization, uh, it's actually a, a need and, or an urgent need for the counties, all the counties to be able to um, uh, come up with the policies and legislations that will be able to allow um, reservation or allocation of uh, at least 1% or 2% as uh, most of the counties, some of the counties that have had these legislations have been able to uh, set aside. But then the issue should, uh, the, the main thing is really how do we get uh, the communities to raise their voices? Because yes, the, gov the government can steer the, the process and say we are having 0.5%. But will that have an impact? And even those that are uh, have enacted the one percent, for example, uh, Wajir two percent, Tui, but are they living to this two uh, percent? Uh, just recent last month, we had uh, Nakuru coming on board with the two uh, percent requirement from uh, the county allocations. But do they really live to this? So we need to come to have strong voices, especially from the people, from the civil society, uh, to be able to advocate for some of these structures to be affected. And also uh, the voice of the people is very critical in terms of um, uh, having a strong voice on the CIDPs, I mean, for allocation of these resources. So. I think it's uh, an area that we all need to come together again, as I indicated, but the issue of resources is I think what is hampering, but the good thing is that we, when you look at the financing, financing flows that are both coming from the national government and the, and the, and, and the international spaces, there are many opportunities that are untapped by counties and that's why we are extending an olive oil to be able to work with some of the counties and support them. But this has to come through the civil society groups that are present in these areas. So as I mentioned in the other response, we are actually trying to do recruitments and getting into counties. So we believe we should be able to have this uh, cutting across, but currently we have less than uh, 15 counties uh, that have been able to have these policies in place. But again, the good news is that through uh, there is a World Bank funded support uh, that is uh, at a treasury, this is called financing locally climate led uh, actions on climate change. And um, the requirement by treasury is that there must be a tracking mechanism by the counties. And then for the counties to have this, they are required to have plans and policies. So because they really want to benefit from this through COG, uh, they are really trying to rest to have some of these policies in place. But again, I challenge the civil societies in those areas as they rush uh, 
maybe they just want to have these systems in place so that they can tap on this fund. But is it really going to have a hit on the ground? And then lastly, on um, in terms of energy and uh, I mean wind energy and biogas, I think biogas has uh, done a little bit well because of initiatives that we have had and even um, in terms of uh, technology evolution. But in terms of wind, I think we still have uh, challenges, but may mainly it's because it's a resource intensive investment. And uh, most of the mini grids are actually considering hybrids and uh, solar, uh, but then, uh, yeah, I think it's picking up and maybe that can be a separate discussion with um, whoever might be interested. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Wycliffe. Maybe a further addition is that um, as counties um, come up with these uh, climate change policies, I think it's up to us to continue engaging the respective counties on the implementation of the policies that uh, they have put in place uh, so that, uh, you know, they can also be helped to develop the targets that uh, Dr. Wamkoya spoke about, particularly when you are looking at counties uh, that are ripe for implementation of the ecosystem-based approach uh, towards natural resources conservation in this country. That's just something that I wanted to add up, and I know uh, KW the KCCWG is working uh, to support counties on that level, uh, building capacity and trying to see how they can also adopt other tools such as wind energy and the solar biogas that uh, you mentioned. Those are some of the things that uh, uh, we can actually engage KCCWG and see how they can be activated. Um, the final question is to you, Charles. How does one become a member? of IUCN as an organization? And do you have an interest on in the area of plastics and micro uh, plastics in our ocean, rivers, and banks? Then after that, I can see only the hand of Frank Musafir is raised up. Then we give Frank an opportunity to ask the question. Uh, and then after that, we'll wrap it up. We are four minutes past 11 o'clock, so we should be able to wind up this session by 15 past 11. So over to you, Charles. Yes, so thank you. So quickly, there is a there is a procedure and uh, form that's applied when you need to uh, be subscribed as an IUCN member. There are various categories and tiers. As you know, there are state members and non-state members. There are uh, affiliates. So I can't uh, actually break down all that, but I've given the contact of our uh, membership lead for the region. Her name is uh, Caroline Yamamu. Uh, she is always available for you to reach her with any questions. So you can reach Caroline Nyamamu at iucn.org uh, with any queries on um, uh, how uh, an institution uh, organization can register to be an IUCN members. Remember, we go all the way up to indigenous and local community uh, institutions, so long as they meet the uh, criteria and they have the right referrals to get them through uh, the uh, required uh, uh, guidelines. Uh, regarding the marine plastics, yes, uh, we do have um, uh, a regional marine uh, plastics program. Uh, it's, it's currently being implemented in Kenya, Tanzania, Mozambique, and South Africa. Uh, it's, it's working at two levels. It's working at the policy level uh, to be able to influence, uh, you know, nations to come up um, with appropriate, uh, you know, plastic pollution reduction uh, uh, policies and strategies. And uh, scientifically, we've been also undertaking a methodology known as pl plastic hotspotting, uh, which which looks at uh, source to see sort of uh, spectrum and um, identifying point source solution uh, where the heaviest load of uh, those uh, plastic um, pollutants happen within the system and the attendance strategies. We are also bringing in the private sector, uh, for example, Coca-Cola, who you know have been identified globally as one of the biggest pollutants given their beverage and packaging and everything. So there is a mechanism around that. I'll give you uh, the name of uh, the contact lead on our plastic program is Peter Manyara. He's based in uh, our, Cape, our Pretoria office in South Africa. Uh, he's Kenyan, but should be able to really respond to you as to how we're working on that. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Charles. And uh, <clears throat> the contacts for Caroline have been posted on the chat, so you should be able to access that there. Uh, the final, I think it's just a comment by Charles Tonui uh, of, uh, of ACT that um, capacity support 
uh, on fundamentals of climate change and impact on various sectors of the economy to the world level, especially for public officials, is paramount because they collect and collect, they collect and collect contributions from various stakeholders and um, local communities for policy and legislation uh, making. Thank you, Charles, for that. I would now like to give um, an opportunity to um, to Frank, who had his hand raised up. Uh, has he been unable to speak? Frank Musafiri? Yes, Frank, now I think you can unmute yourself and then ask your question or your comment. Okay, and I should ask it to uh, Still, thanks so much. Uh... I raised, uh, I raised uh, my heart by mistake because I've been a public uh, transport. Uh, I have been listening since uh, nine. And uh, thanks very much for everybody's uh, presentation. I think uh, this is a great uh, opportunity for us to see. I, I could have asked quite a number of uh, questions, but uh, uh, you know, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mukoya is out, but uh, I think uh, he gave a very good chronology of, on, uh, of our event on uh, UNFCCC, and um, I, I think I'll get back to him uh, directly on uh, what uh, I wanted to ask. Thank you very much, and uh, let, let's talk uh, in future. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Frank, and uh, glad that you are here. We will pick up uh, this conversation with you also, because I know you're also an expert on climate matters, uh, and we still continue to engage you. Uh, thank you. Um, good. <clears throat> So moving forward now, uh, because we've had lots of uh, information um, uh, poured out today and discussed, uh, one of the area is we need to bring the natural resources sector uh, participation and active involvement in the UNFCC process, uh, which is very crucial. And uh, also before you participate in the process, it will be very crucial for us to understand uh, where we are at the moment and where the gaps are. And uh, based on the decisions that Dr. Wamkoya mentioned, uh, I think we will be able to uh, to bring the sector participants up to speed on that. And he also challenged um, um, uh, the sector that particularly we need to start developing global goals on adaptation. Uh, you cannot come up with any adaptation program uh, without really defining uh, what is your national goal, and it has to be realistic and clear, and then uh, what is the sector going to contribute in order to achieve that. I think I did pick that as a concern. And then number two, we, he also challenged us to say that the sector is not well organized uh, as a crucial player <clears throat> on even implementing some of the decisions that are coming up, uh, including also activities here on the ground. Uh, and then um, Amakobe uh, took us through the process of, uh, of uh, joining the wildlife and tourism uh, thematic uh, group within the KCCWC, which is um, currently uh, helping to connect that, uh, but would like to see more organizations register uh, so that collectively, uh, together with KCCWG, we can actually strengthen the voice of the wildlife sector and the tourism, which is the beneficiary of the product that we conserve, uh, to be able to be at the forefront in, um, in participating in those processes. Uh, then Charles has challenged us, uh, particularly in the sector, uh, in terms of looking at uh, ecosystem-based adaptation. And what I liked about the concept is that it's scalable at the community level, which is right at the lowest level. So it's not something that starts from up, but it's something that starts from the bottom, and then the impact itself will find its way up into the climate change adaptation or mitigation measures uh, that uh, will have been set in the climate change strategy in the country. Um, finally, uh, those are then the take home uh, actions that uh, we are going to work. Uh, but also just to let you know that um, this is the third uh, conversation that uh, we've had this year. And I would like to invite Sheila uh, to just mention about the, any other upcoming events that will be there, uh, which, will be, which she will get uh, back to you. Over to you, Sheila. Are there any upcoming events that we've planned that you'd like to 
notify the participants. Uh, thank you, Steve. And thank you everyone for attending this uh, conservation conversation. We do have them every month. And so this was uh, the March uh, conservation conversation. We have another one coming up in April. We'll be able to share that information on email in, uh, in due course, but we are hoping that you will also be able to join us so that we continue the discussions. Uh, so I take this opportunity to again, thank you uh, for joining us today. Thank you so much, Charles Wycliffe and George you dropped off uh, for accepting to be part of our panelists um, for this uh, conservation conversation. We hope that we will still join us um, in future uh, when and if we invite you again. And to all our participants also, thank you for being with us until the end of this session. Uh, we hope that you have learned something from today's um, speakers and you're going in your own small way to do something to, um, to reverse climate change where you live in. Uh, so Steve, I'll be able to share the other information on email with all the participants. But yes, we have a session coming up in April. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sheila. Um, the other um, uh, topics that uh, Sheila will be communicating to you has to do in terms of uh, part B of the climate change discussions, uh, particularly how we mainstream the youth into climate change um, actions. And then there is also the issue of the role of women. So we will also see how to capture that. Today look like a uh, a male-dominated uh, panel. And so the next one, you will see uh, more integration, including also how we bring the communities also into the discussion. Uh, so having spent uh, 15 extra minutes of your time, because we are to end at about 11 o'clock, I also want to take this opportunity and thank you so much. Uh, the recording of the session will be shared with you. I think somebody has asked that question. And so you'll be able to follow up with that and we shall get in touch again. Thank you so much and do have uh, a lovely uh, morning.